Good afternoon, everyone. I'm really thrilled to lead this wonderful panel where I hope that we will learn from speakers from very different backgrounds about how the environment is changing us. And as we all know, the environment affects all of us, the air we breathe, the food we eat, the water we drink, and the health effects of the environment are becoming more and more apparent as the effects of climate change also become more apparent. In our panel today, we have people who are studying chronic diseases and how Karen Hacker, who literally wrote the textbook on um, community-based participatory research, which is critical in getting communities involved in the research and in the focus in their environment. Um, we have Whitney Gray, who will be talking to us about the built environment and how we can change it. And we also have Corey Stern, who's been an advocate in the field of environmental health. And Corey, I'd like to turn to you because while we're talk gonna be talking about environmental health and climate change, what you've been doing and the amazing work you did advocating for Flint, Michigan, and actually throughout your entire career, is dealing with an old environmental toxin or a toxicant, lead, and the effects that we're seeing. And it's really not from the climate change per se, but more what happened in the past when lead-based paint, when lead-based pipes were used for our waterways. So if you can just talk about some of the work that you've done um, in mitigating some of the disasters, the larger environmental disasters. Sure, uh, well, thank you all for having me. Um, you know, unfortunately, sometimes litigation is required to effectuate really big change. Uh, and when you're dealing with uh, infrastructure throughout an entire nation and on a more micro level throughout cities that comprise the nation, that infrastructure is only as good as it was when it was originally built. And unfortunately, throughout our country, there's a ton of lead pipes. And at the time that those pipes were laid, you know, back 40, 50, 60, 70, 100 years ago in this country, there was not as much of an awareness about the dangers of lead. And so now we have pipes that are 20, 30, 40 feet buried underground throughout our cities, throughout the country. And in order to ensure that children aren't made sick by drinking water that flows through lead pipes or adults don't get sick by way of consuming water that flows through lead pipes, there has to be some significant change to something that has been part of the fabric of this country, which is lead pipes. And, uh, you know, oftentimes cities are more reactive to issues that arise than they are proactive in trying to resolve them before they happen. And I actually think there's a significant connection between the past and the future. When, when you look at where uh, the country is in terms of lead and its infrastructure and the pipes, as well as in lead paint and in tons of old buildings that were either constructed before 1960 or 1978 and have never been renovated, if we had been more proactive and, and used information that was likely available to us as a society prior to utilizing lead and paint, lead and gasoline, lead and pipes, we may have found alternatives to, to that type of uh, flow system. And when you look at the future and you look at climate change, if we take certain precautions now, and I'm sure that the, the doctors who will follow me will talk more intelligently than I can about this, but if we take certain precautions now, when we know a time bomb might go off, rather than trying to pick up the pieces once the bomb has gone off, then we'll be in a much better situation. And, and unfortunately, it's, it's impoverished communities that are most affected by all of this. You know, when, when you want to deal with climate change and you want to have more, more efficient vehicles, you have to be able to afford them. If you want to eat a plant-based diet and stop factory farming, you have to be able to afford types of foods that are not necessarily available at Piggly Wiggly or in some of these, uh, these communities. So to look at the future, you have to look at the past. And I think that the situation involving lead throughout our country can be instructive uh, for how we deal with climate change. No, I think that's a critical point, and we've heard from some of the panels, and we'll hear about health equity and how everything is intertwined. Karen, I, you know, you lead a division of chronic disease prevention and health um, for the CDC, and I think some of the elements that Corey was raising about how lead, as an example, can lead to chronic health issues. 
but how you find some of the work you're doing and some of the forward thinking of the CDC can, um, how can we prevent disease environmentally based you through some of the work you're doing or what kind of preventive means can we use? So uh, I think that your, your point is really well taken here, which is that we are uh, to some extent, not 100%, um, the products of our environments, correct? And that environment includes our social community, our social networks, our built environment, our air, our water, all of those types of things. And we know that in communities that are impoverished, often they're also considered environmental justice issues, correct? So for chronic disease, one of the problems we're facing now is that our food environment, our physical built environment, our opportunities for physical activity, um, those types of things really do influence our health outcomes. And one of the things we're really talking about at CDC and trying is the whole world now of social determinants of health and really trying to figure out how can we help mobilize and support communities as we begin to address these issues, which are really those root causes um, that are so critical to really ensuring equal opportunities for everyone and driving us really towards a health equity perspective. Um, I do wanna mention that I am particularly concerned now because I do believe that COVID-19 will cause an increase in chronic disease um, and unfortunately, based on the most recent obesity data, um, it does look like the likes we have not seen before. And the challenges that face us with regard to how that's going to impact all of the other chronic diseases, you know, I often think, you know, obesity comes first, then diabetes, then heart disease, and soon after cancers. Um, you know, plus we have a huge health debt that has occurred during COVID-19 where folks just literally have not gone to the doctor. I'm sure everybody here knows that. And so a lot of undetected cancers, for example, is something we're very concerned about. But again, we need to create, we need to basically engage in with our communities and that community participatory manner, strategies for improving the health of a community, the opportunities for everyone to live the best and healthiest lives that they can. Thank you. And, and you know, I think that's a nice transition to introducing us to Whitney Gray who um, I'd like to talk a, a little bit about some of the work you're doing um, in terms of the built environment and the lead buildings and really trying to think about how we move forward and how we can change how we look at where we spend most of our time, whether it's our working day, and even if we think about the built environment, which is where we live, where we work, how we can utilize that to either not be future polluters or how do we improve where we are now? Absolutely. So you spend about 90% of your time indoors. That's about 90,000 hours of your life at work. So if you are 50, that means about 45 years of your life have been spent indoors. And you need to ask yourself if the buildings you're spending time are making you well or making you sick. And the architects that are out there leading this don't necessarily have training in health. And so you've chosen to live the majority of your life in environments that have been designed and built for people, but not necessarily for your health. And we can do better. And I think my ask and my call to action for the audience today is that we have a moment now in history to do this right. We are in the history books living this moment. And in the 1950s, there was a split between architecture, urban planning, and public health in the medical profession. We were working together to design and beautify cities, thinking about density issues and the reduction of infectious disease and contagion by designing such things such as Central Park, which were the lungs of the city. We lost that connection, and the argument is because we focused too much on the individual, the pharmaceutical intervention, and we didn't look upstream of the places that we're spending 90% of our time. We have an incredible opportunity with the green building movement and with the well building movement to focus again on the places we spend time. And I don't think anyone needs to be reminded coming out of this pandemic what it's like to be indoors all day, every day. Um, so my hope is that this is a movement that we work together to think about how environments can be designed for our health and where we're spending time for all populations. Thank you. I, I think one of the challenges in environmental health or environmental health issues 
is that, as you, you have said, Whitney, how do you make the invisible visible? Because we hear about climate change, but we, and we may see a storm that affects us. We just were affected by Hurricane Ida that affected broad swaths of this country from landfall in the Gulf Coast to massive flooding on the Northeast. So then we say, okay, we're having these great storms as a result of, of climate change. But for many other people on a day-to-day -day basis, we hear climate change is real, it is here, we must do something about it. But how can we affect the health of our communities? And how can we make these small differences? And how do we go forward in making it so that it is relevant to us, not just these macro events like a hurricane, or, um, but how do we say we need to take the environment seriously and realize how important it is to all of our health? Karen, do you wanna take a stab at that one? Right. Well, you know, I think one of the things, and um, I think it was said earlier, is that the first thing is to uh, begin to understand how climate change is affecting so many different aspects of health. And I think, you know, we typically think about the storms and the emergencies, but we don't really think about what it's doing to our food supply, potentially, what it's doing to literally the insects, uh, the plants that are growing. You know, we think allergies are going to rise uh, enormously. And, you know, even in environment where we're doing our best to decrease air pollution, when the temperature gets hotter, the air pollution will get worse, ozone will go up. So we are already pretty aware of what the types of things that are going to happen. And I think the big challenge is, can we get in front of these? Can we both do the things that are responsible, cut our carbon footprint, uh, you know, think about sustainability, decrease our waste, all of those things, particularly for corporations or large organizations, hospitals, our employers, they can do a lot of this stuff. But in addition to that, think about what do we need to do to support our workforce, to support individuals in communities, recognizing that these things are gonna happen. Uh, prior to coming to CDC, I was a health department director in Allegheny County, Pennsylvania, which is it, it, sitting in Pittsburgh and, I can tell you, even in the short time I was there, the amount and volume of water that was that we were seeing over time was just so much higher. And people were complaining about their basements being flooded and mold was growing. And we never had to really deal with those types of problems before. So part of this, I think, is really thinking ahead, creating your climate change plan so that you can actually be effective in meeting the needs of the population that you are actually serving. Thank you so much. Corey, how do you think, as an environmental health advocate, how do you think that we can make climate change and the health effects related to the environment relevant for all of our daily lives? I think it's important in underserved communities to provide some form of education for individuals as to their own personal health, the ways in which they can keep their families healthy in simple, efficient ways, because the climate is drastically affected by the foods that each of us eat, by the amount of time we spend walking rather than in a car. And I think that for uh, individuals who have suffered from uh, environmental racism or environmental injustice as a result of their, their social stature, their, their, their socioeconomic stature, you have to be able to explain to them on an individualized level how their own health will be affected by the choices that they make and, and the role that that plays in our larger health as a community. And so if, if a mom in Flint, Michigan understands that the three quarter of a mile trip to the grocery store would not only decrease if she were to walk to the store every three days, her own risk of uh, you know, terrible things happening from COVID if she gets in just a little bit better health, how that will also affect the environment because the lack of emissions from the vehicle that she's using. And so I think they have to be tied together, individual personal health with community health, because the decisions each of us makes on a daily basis has a drastic and dramatic effect on the health of our communities as a whole and on, and on climate change. No, I think that's a, it's a critical point. You know, Whitney, one, one thing that I'm thinking about as we're having this discussion is so many of the changes that we can make into the buildings and, and 
regain that interface between urban planning and public health um, and, and the environment and how we can affect the climate going forward with use of appropriate building materials, um, a lot of that costs money. And then that brings us back to some of the questions and the discussions we've been having earlier today about health equity and whether things we can do things in a level that will be accessible to all and not just have a tiered system where people with more resources have better buildings. Um, but how do we make things more equitable? So it's an incredible question, which is that we need to move from cost per square foot to cost per person and from lagging indicators, which are death and disease, into leading indicators, which are health promotion investment. We're working very closely with ESG around environmental social governance. This is an extra financial that companies report on in order to determine what is their investment in the environment. And this is publicly then shared so that you can understand what is their leading indicators on health promotion for their company. And what I want to include here is that when they're tracking health in ESG, which has not had a very strong presence, and they're not necessarily tracking the environments that they've created for their workers of all classes and all backgrounds and all places of the world. But I think too often health is only considered of their own employees and not the communities that they are part of. I think there is an incredible power for businesses to think not introvertedly about their own um, walls, but also extrovertedly, if you will, about the communities that they are part of. We actually see incredible, I think, power in the private sector to have engagement on community health and to be able to create healthy environments for their workers and also for the community surrounding, which means how do you get to work? Where do you go on break? What is the healthy food? And be engaged in that. There's so many beautiful examples of companies that have provided these, um, everything from the classic volunteering programs to the hiring of those mental health backgrounds to the beautification of the neighboring community to air quality monitoring sensor tracking. So I would really look to companies being responsible held accountable and empowered to lead a conversation on designing for not the cost per square foot of the building, but on the cost per person. And if you don't mind me adding to the earlier point around making the invisible visible, what I wanna say there is that right now, a lot of people are in a time of fear, if we're really honest, it's fear of the next case, fear of what happens when we go out. And I really hope the conversation moves from the pandemic to epidemic to endemic conversation of power. And so if you are going to understand and take power back, that means you need control, which means someone needs to translate information so that you can make a decision about risk. I think that is a big conversation today around when it comes to environmental risk and your own health. We need to be better translators to help people understand how the places they're spending time are healthy or not healthy, and therefore putting a greater impetus and I think catalyzing agent around companies to create healthy places for their workers and for the communities surrounding them. I, I think those are all amazing points. I think you know one of the things that we need to focus on is is how do we improve green spaces, which will affect all of our all of our health, whether it's places that we can exercise uh, that can affect some of the chronic diseases that Karen and her unit are trying to prevent. How can we improve our mood but just by looking out at greenery? There have been studies that have shown that, but we have about a minute left. So I'd love to have everyone's last thoughts on what we can do today in, in 20 seconds or less to make our small dent in how we can uh, affect the climate and how we can affect the environment. I'm gonna start with you, Karen. Well, I think you heard some of it today from the other speakers, but I will say from my perspective, this is not work that healthcare can do by itself. This is work that you have to engage in partnerships to be able to achieve. And so what Whitney was just talking about in terms of you know, influences within your communities, you can't go out there and be the head. You really have to listen to the community and understand what it is that they would like to see and then engage with them and engage with other partners, whether it's the transportation sector, or the food sector, or the housing sector, to really make a difference. And I think it's that kind of strategy that is going to really help us address these social determinants of health in the long run, meet climate change head on. Great. Final words, Corey? 
just think we need to invest in our communities on an individual by individual basis. Uh, if, if someone's attending or, or spending time at a food pantry that's provided in their community, the food at that pantry matters. If someone uh, is being provided with social services that permit them to, to, to go shopping at a grocery store, the food that's available to them needs to be healthy. And so both education and investment in individuals in our communities will help uh, our community as a whole. Great. Whitney, last word, and then we're gonna end this wonderful session. I'm just so honored because my speaker said it all. And Corey, I love that idea of connection and investment. What I'll add is that for too long, chronic disease was thought of as we are not connected to each other and your habits cause your disease. And that's not true. We are so deeply connected. And if it's not the largest reminder ever in an infectious disease crisis, that your health impacts others and the air we breathe is the air that we share. So we have to invest in health and not just invest in disease. And I think it's made us all aware of our environment in many different ways. The pandemic has really focused on that. And the environment is more than air, water, food, but it's all around us and it affects every aspect of our life from health and disease. I wanna thank our panel, Karen Hacker, Whitney Gray, Corey Stern. Thank you so much for your participation today and um, enjoy the rest of the afternoon. <laughs>